All right, so this is my attempt at doing a hopefully good review session for you. So this is the chapter one, two, and three review. I'm gonna go through solution by solution and hopefully this will help. So question number one, okay, it says, a recent survey of 2,041 American college students indicated that 20% of them lived at home during their first year of college, and they spent an average of $413 on textbooks during their first year of college. So identify the population, the sample, and the variables. Okay, so let's do population. And so the population, notice how it says 2,041 American college students, so the population would be all American college students. That'll be our population. Our sample will be specifically the 2041 American college students. Okay. And the variables in the study. So what are they studying? They're in their first year of college. And we're looking to see if they lived alone um, in the first year of college and that they spent so much money. So the variables are, um, I would say, um, living situation. And all we really know about that is at home, or not. We don't really know if they're not at home where they're at. And then we also know average spent on textbooks. Okay. And then we're also indicate whether it's quantitative or qualitative. So living at home, that would be qualitative because it's a category. And then average spent on textbook would be quantitative because that's a number. It's a number that makes sense, okay? And then it also wants to know what was the average amount of the 14, 13. Since the $1,413 was from the sample, the 14, 13 was from the sample. So it is a statistic. And we might be guessing that that's what the population spends, but that's what we would go for. So it looks like I think I've answered everything for number one. Okay, so there's your answers to number one. Let's look at number two. Okay, for each of the following variables, determine whether their are variables qualitative or quantitative, and if the variable is quantitative, indicate this discrete or continuous. So number two. So we have time it takes to complete a puzzle, time for a puzzle. I'm just going to do this. Since it's time, that would be quantitative. And since it's time, I would say it's continuous because it's a measurement. And then the next one is eye color. Since it's eye color, it's a quality. So it's qualitative. And it doesn't really apply for uh, continuous or discrete because it's not a number. Um, the rating of movies now, even though this number is one to five, they're stars. So that would be a qualitative thing because you're doing it as a category. Um, so for me, I would put that under the line of being qualitative. And again, we wouldn't do that. Um, telephone number. 
Again, a telephone number is kind of a weird thing because it kind of falls under like a category. So that would also be qualitative. It's a number, but you're not using it as a number. And then finally, the number of students in class. That would be uh, quantitative. And it would be more discrete because you're counting. I think I just spelled that wrong. OK, so if it's a measurement, it's continuous. If it's a count, it's a more uh, discrete. I'll just put the IS there. OK, so I think that would be number two. And don't get uh, confused with movie ratings, because even though it's stars, you kind of think of it from the perspective like um, five stars is good, one stars is bad, but five stars, you, I mean, I could have a movie that's five stars that you think is one star and vice versa. So the numbers really don't mean anything other than telling you something's good or bad. So really think of movie ratings as like a good movie, great movie, crappy movie. And then telephone number, even though it's a number, it's not the number, you can't really do like a, a, a calculation with the number. So that makes it more qualitative in nature. Okay, that's number two. Let's look at number three. I'm going to try to consciously not go too fast here. And this to determine the level of measurement. We have nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. So let's do time it takes to complete a puzzle for the time of the puzzle. Time is always going to be a numeric value, which means it has to be interval or ratio. But zero time does mean nothing. So that would be ratio. Time in general will be ratio. Eye color, so it's the same variables as before. That's um, nominal because you really can't put an order to that and it's a category. So we would say that's nominal. Remember, it has to be a category for nominal. And then rate movie ratings, that would be ordinal because I would think it's a category, but one star is worse than two stars, or you could say five stars is better than four stars. Temperature, temperature is always interval because it's a number, but zero doesn't mean no temperature. It generally means it's just cold. And a student's favorite subject, that would basically be also nominal because it's a category. And even though it's your favorite, there's really no numeric ordering to that. So remember, um, Nominal is categories with really no ordering to it. Ordinal is a category where there's kind of a natural ordering, like, you know, t-shirt size, small, medium, large. We know large is bigger than medium, like there's a natural order there. Um, interval is a number, but it's when the starting point doesn't really make sense or it's kind of arbitrary. Um, so zero doesn't always mean nothing. It means just your starting point. But with ratio, zero means something. So zero would mean there's nothing. So if your zero is like, meaning nothing like zero salary, zero weight, um, then that would be ratio. And you don't actually have to get the zero, just that the zero exists. OK, let's look at number four. Um, identify the type of sampling as systematic, cluster, stratified, convenience, or simple random in each of the following. A mathematic department polls 25 faculty and 25 students. Well, if you look at that for part A, that would be more um, stratified. because it is two groups. And we're kind of assuming that there would be more than um, 25 faculty. So from all the faculty, you're picking 25. From all the students, you're picking 25. So it's really the two groups. And we pick some from each group. That's kind of what makes it stratified. Part B, a, poll, a store polls every 25th com, customer. The 25th, doing it that way, means it's systematic. Because it's basically every case. If you remember what that is. So whenever you have like a list where you're pulling every 5th, 20th, 25th, or whatever, that's more systematic. C, a statistic student polls their Facebook friends. Well, if you're only polling your Facebook friends, that's convenience. basically because only your friends can be chosen, okay? 
And then for part D, let's see what we got there. Um, apartment manager of the 34 apartment complex interviews all residents living on floors 5, 15, and 7. When it says all residents, so basically this would be cluster. Basically, it's grouped by floor. And we picked everyone on three floors. So only those three floors got chosen, but everyone on those three floors got picked. And then part E would be an instructor chooses four students to work on a special project by putting names of everyone in a class hat and choosing four of the names. I would say that's random. It seems like everyone has a chance. An equal chance to be chosen, okay? So the key thing is with stratified, you're grouping them and you're picking some from each group. With systematic, it's every so many people and it's pretty systematic on how you do that. That's hence the names. Um, if it's anything where you're just really being lazy and picking something convenient to you, that would be convenient like the Facebook friends. If you're dividing like the apartment building up into floors and then picking everyone from each floor, that makes it a uh, cluster. And then finally, if you are using, you know, putting names in a hat and just randomly picking them, that really is random because everyone in the class should have an equal chance of being chosen. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's go on to number five. A uh, simple random sample of 1,005 American adults were asked, how would you prefer to pay for a new road construction? The results of the survey are given by um, new tolls, increase in taxes, and new roads. Convert the distribution to frequency distribution. So let's do this. So new tolls, increase taxes, and no new roads. I'm kind of abbreviating in here. So this was my 412. This was my 281. This was my 312. So the first thing I need to do is add those up. It should be 1,005 because they told us that was our sample. So to convert this to a relative frequency, so this will be frequency. We need relative frequency. So what we need to do there is the 412 over the 1005 the 281 over the 1005 and the 312 over 1005. So it doesn't say, I don't think, let's look. It doesn't say how many decimal places to use. So I'll just go to a couple. So let me pull up the calculator and pull it over here. So I'm not gonna do that in my head because that's not gonna happen. So 412 over 1005, I get 0.4099. Nine five two eighty one divided by a thousand and five is point two seven nine six, and then finally the three twelve divided by one oh oh five. I get point three one oh four. Okay, so those are all my numbers. Quick double check. Yep, looks like I typed them incorrectly, so that's always good. So that would make it the part A is basically right there where I convert it to a relative frequency distribution, and that's pretty much it. And you can round those a little bit and then construct a relative frequency bar graph for this distribution. So I think I'll do something along this line. And this is um, qualitative data. So for part B, I don't need to have the thing. So I'll say, the new taxes, then the increase, and then the no roads. So we kind of know which categories they are. And then the percentages go up to about 40%. So I'm gonna do, make my line a little bit nicer here. I think I'll go rush straight up. I mean, I have graph paper, I should take advantage of it. Make that a little bit better. Okay, so what I think I'll do is I'll go by 10%. So this will be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And I'm going two bars for each one of them, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And so this will be relative frequency. 
and we'll do um, so now my proportions would be 0.4. So the first one would go just a little bit above the 0.4. It's a little too high there. So the first one should go up. We'll just go just a tad past the 0.4, kind of come down. The next one would be 0.27. So I'm going to come up here a little bit past halfway. Ah, well, I didn't mean to do that. Let me go pull that back up. Wait a second for it to come back. Okay, there we go. So the second one should come up, up to just past the halfway mark, maybe like that. And then the last one will go up to 0 0.31. So we'll go maybe up here, just past 0 0.3. And there you go. Um, and that would be our, our frequency bar graph. And you don't have to have them next to each other because they're qualitative data. So that would be number five, A and B. And that's all we wanted. Okay, perfect. Number six. Number six, I think we're primarily just reading a bar chart. Uh, let me scroll down so we can see all of it. Yeah, okay. There's number six. Um, the scale is at the top. It really should be at the bottom, but that just happens to be the way it was drawn. And notice there is the extra point out here. So to estimate the value of the median monthly storage. So the median would be this line right here. So it's in between 400 and 500. So this is going to be a little bit of a guess. So for part A, the median is equal to the second line in the box. And I would say that's roughly, and it's in dollars, so I'll put a dollar sign there, maybe like four, well, if you figure that this is 400, that's 500, this would be 500 here. I'm going to say it's about 450. So something in that ballpark would be about right. It doesn't have to be exactly that. And then for part B, 75% of customers are paying less than what amount? Well, 75% either refers to being Q3 and all the way to the left or Q1 and being all the way to the right. But it says 75% of customers are paying less than what amount? So I would go with that's Q3, which is roughly be where this line is. And that's about 700. And that would be 75% pay less than this because that's basically what the third quartile is, okay? And then are there any changes and any charges that are considered outlier? If yes, what was the estimated charge? So for part C, I would say yes, and it would be the, the single dot, which is roughly, and again, if we go out to this dot and go all the way up, it's probably, I would say 1,500. Because remember, the scale here is four two by twos. So that's about halfway between the 1400 and what would be the next hash mark. So I would say about 1500. And again, you don't have to be perfect with those, just be in the right ballpark. And then part D says the middle 50% of customers pay between what two estimated values. So that means we need to find Q1 and Q3. Now we already decided Q1. Well, actually, we didn't. It's down here. And it's kind of. You know, if this is 200 and 300 would be about smack dab in the middle, I would say this is about 375. And again, you know, we're just kind of guesstimating here. So just be as close as you can. And then Q3, we already decided was about 700. So the middle 50% pay between, so middle 50% pay between 375 to 700. And again, you know, the answers in the answer key or something you might come up might not be exactly those, but as long as you're in the ballpark, that's appropriate. Okay. So that one was all about reading a box plot. So I think we got that one down. And then I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, I think, if I can. Yeah, it helps a little bit. I'm going to make it a tad smaller. So I'm going to be able to see the questions and read it well. Okay, so number seven now.
Number seven says the pie chart below represents the number of days that the stock price for a company Malnet went up, MathNet went up or had no change. And you can kind of see in the picture here, if this data was gathered on over 300 days, how many of the days did the stock prices not go up? So it's total of 300 days. And we want the ones where the stock didn't go up. So I'm gonna have to make that bigger. There was, um, um, how many days did the stock price go up? Um, and the stock price went up 43, so it was up 43.33% of the time. So what we'd have to do is do 0.4333 times the 300 days to get an answer of how many days. So let's do that. So I'm gonna clear this. Let's do 0.4333 times 300. And I get 129. 0.99, and this is number of days. So I would say it's roughly 130 days. So out of the four, the 300 days, about 130 of them were days where the stock went up. And I think that's all. So roughly we could say out of 300 days, stock went up 130 days. Okay, and I think that's the only question that one has. Okay, let me scroll down, make it a little bit smaller so we can see the whole thing. Okay, so again, we have another box plot. And again, normally the box plots are going, um, uh, the scales on the bottom. For this one, it was just the way it was done. So it says, are there any outliers in this data set? I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger so we can see. And this is the number of books someone read over the summer. I just wanna be able to see those numbers a little bit better. Okay, so are there any outliers? For part A, I would say no outliers um, because there are no um, extra points outside um, the whiskers. There's no, nothing seems unusual there without actually calculating the lower and upper fence. I don't know for sure, but nothing looks amiss. So I would just say no. Um, what is the value of Q1? So Q1 is approximately. So if you go to Q1, it looks like it's about four books. So I'll make sure we know it's books. Um, Cause if you look Q1 is that first line. What is the percentage of students read less than, less than seven books? So seven is right about where Q3 would be. So I would say seven equals Q3. So that tells me 75% read less than seven books because it corresponds to the third quartile. And then finally, what interval represents the middle 50%? So again, we have that middle 50%. So the middle 50, is equal to Q1 to Q3. So Q1 appears to be about four. Q3 appears to be about seven. So that range equals three books. So what interval represents the middle 50%? It's really the four to seven books, which is a range of three books. I'm not sure what the final answer is in the back, but that would be either, you know, either part of that would work. Okay, so that's number make this smaller. That was number eight, so doing pretty good here. All right, let's do number nine. Move it over just a little bit. So this is the relative frequency histogram below represents the wait times and minutes for a table at a popular restaurant on a Saturday night. So number nine. So use the histogram to estimate the following. I might have to make that a little bit bigger so we can see it a little bit better. Um, what percentage of customers waited more than 22 minutes? Um, so for part A, waited more than 22 minutes. 
And so if we look, and these are all relative frequencies, so we can just add the percents. So more than 22 starts here. And so it's these last three boxes. So this middle box to me, it goes from 0.1 to 0.2. I'm gonna say that would be 0.15 for that first box. The second box, if this is 0.1, this looks like it's kind of a 0.4 to me because it's a little bit less than half. So I'll say 0.4 for that one. And then the last would be another 0.4. And again, I'm kind of guesstimating here. So um, my answer might not match the answer key perfectly, but I think those heights are about that. This height right here. So this first box right here, I think that height's about 0.15, but then these two are a little bit low, less than halfway. So it'd be 0.15 plus 0.8. So that should be 0.23. And it wanted it a percentage, so about 23%. Um, so 15 plus 8, so yeah, it'll be 23. Okay. And then for part B there, um, what percentage of customers waited less than 20 minutes? Yep. So if I go less than 20, 20 is right here. So it would be these two boxes. So less than 20 minutes. That to me would be the first group. I think that's about a 0.4 plus. And then that second group, that's not quite 0.4. It's a little bit more, I would say like 0.38 roughly. And again, you know, if you said point, you know, um, three nine for that one, that's about, you know, that's in the right ballpark. So I'm gonna say it's roughly 0.42. And again, I'm not looking at the answer key in the back, but that would be about where it would be. Um, in the right ballpark. So if you have 0.41 or 0.43, that's close enough. Um, so it'd be, and again, it wants percent. So that would be 42%. And then if it sampled 500 customers, how many of them waited between 22 and 24 minutes? So 22 to 24 is this group. So 22 to 24. is apparently or roughly be this height right there. So again, I think that's about a 0.15%. Okay, and that's what I guessed earlier. So it'd be 15% of 500. And that will give us, let's do the math here, 0.15 times 500. And I get 75. So it'd be 75 people um, waited between the 22 and 24 minutes. Okay, and then for part D, well, actually I should probably say that. So 70, 75 people waited between 22 to 24 minutes. If we needed a sentence, it would be that. Okay, and then finally part D, it says, what is the shape? Well, if you kind of look at it, I'm going to kind of recreate it here. You have this low thing here, and then you have a high one, a lower one, a slightly lower one, and then kind of like this. So if you were to take like a smooth curve and do over it, it kind of looks like that. So I would say um, a, a right skew, a right or a positive. Say right here, right or positive skew. And if you want, you could even say slight. I mean, it's not off the charts, but it is there. Okay, it's not quite a bell shape. It's got a bit of a bell shape in the middle, but then it's got that little bit of a tail. So I would go a right or positive skew on that one. That's what I would say. And again, sometimes it can be a little bit open to interpretation, but there is a tail there. So I would go with that. Okay, I keep wanting to say if anyone has questions. Okay, so now we have a big old thing where it says construct a frequency distribution for this data set using, I'm going to go to another page for this one, number 10, um, using the data and with the first class um, lower limit of 20 in a class width of 10. So let's just kind of construct the class. So for this one, we want to start a lower limit of 20, and then this would be 30, this would be 40, this would be 50, this would be 60, this would be 70, and I'm thinking 80 and 90. I don't know if we need to go that far, but we'll see. And then, and we have to do histogram as well. So this would go to 29, 
this would go to 39, this would go to 49, this would go to 59, this would be 69, this would be 79, this would be 89, and this would be 99. And actually we could probably go to 100, but it doesn't look we have that, so I think we'd be good. And then literally we could either order the data set on the calculator, or we can just go do the frequency distribution. Um, and it, since it'll take a little while to do it in the calculator, I'll go old school. And I'm gonna actually go down, no, I'll go across, that might be easier. So we have a 70 and I'm gonna do this to make life a little bit easier. Sad part is I even have graph paper and I'm still not that neat, but that's okay. We do our best. So let's do the tally. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna go across the rows. So we have one in the 70s, we have a 56, we have a 48, we have a 53, we have a 52, we have a 66, a 48, a 36, a 49 and a 28. So that's the first row. Now I'm going to go to the second row. We have a 35, uh, 58, 62, 45, 60, 38, 73, 45. So I can do that. Uh, 51, so I can do that, 56, uh, 51, 46, we go here, I'm, not, I'm in the third row, so 46, 39, uh, 56, 32, oh, actually, 32, I could do that, so then we have a 44, a 60, a 51, um, a 44, 63, 50, 46. And now I'm to the last row. We have a 69, a 53, a 70, a 33, a 54, a 55, and a 51. Okay, so it looks like assuming I did it all right. So that means I really didn't need these last two groups, but I wasn't sure about that. So then it looks like our tally, if we actually do the frequency over here, so we know what they are. We have one there. It looks like we have six here. We have nine here. We have 14 here. We have six there and three there. And that should add up to 40. And if it doesn't, then I miscounted. So let's quick check that. So we have a seven plus nine plus 14 plus nine. Oh, I'm missing one. Cause it says we should have 40 of them. Uh, 40 patients. So crap, I'm missing one of them. Uh, okay. See, this is why doing it this way kind of sucks. So did I count wrong? One, four, 19, five, nine, six, one. Well, I'm gonna go with it. I'm, I know I'm off by one that should add up to 40 and mine adds up to 39, but let's, you know, what we could do is this. All right, this is, I didn't, I was trying to avoid this, but we could do this, clear, stat. This is why you don't want to do it the way I just did it. Let's do it the way that makes sense. Clear that list out. I'm going to enter the data. So 70, 56, 48, 48. I might have only counted those once. 53, 52, 66, 48, 36, 49. 28, 35, I'm going by the rows again. I probably should have done it this way to begin with, but now you see how easy it is to make a mistake. Wait, no, it should be four, six.
This is why I don't give you data sets quite this long on an exam. Okay, so I got 40 things in there. So I'm gonna quick double check it since I've already screwed up counting once. I don't wanna do that again. So I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning. And I know this is a pain, but honestly, it makes life easier. And I can see that I already screwed up a number here. So we should have 70. And then I'm gonna insert my 56. So you get to see all sorts of mistakes today. So 70, 56, okay, 48, 48, 53, 52, 66, 48, 36, 49, 28, 35, 58, 62, 45, 60, 38, 73, 45, 51, 56, 51, 40, oh, wait, 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 51, okay, 46, 39, 56, 32, 44, 60, 51, 44, 63, 50, 46, 69, 53, 70, 33, 54, 55, 51. And you can see how 51 is the 40th piece of data. So that is right. Now I've checked the data set. So this is what I would do to make my life easier. I'm going to go to calc and then go to sort A and tell it to sort list one um, accordingly. That way, when I go check these numbers, I'll see where I made my mistake. I missed count something. So let's see, uh, from the 20 to 21, I have um, one thing. And then for the 30s, let's scroll down. I have, I should have six. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep, I have six things there, so that was right. Then the 40s, I should have nine things. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's where I made a mistake. This should be one more thing in here. But let's just double check the rest of them. For the 50s, I should have 14. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah. That would be my 14th one. Okay. And you could also do this by looking at the numbers we're on. So that's 14. And then I should have six here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That's good. And then one, two, three. Okay. So it matches up. You didn't have to count them like I just did. You actually could have used the count at the bottom here to figure it out, but let's just go old school and literally count them. Okay. So we construct the frequency distribution. So that's part A. That's part A. And then part B was construct the histogram for this. Now this is numeric. So these should be next to each other. Okay. Um, let me make this, well, I can do it this way. So my lowest group is 20. So what I'll do it up here. My highest frequency is 14. I can actually kind of do it right here, so it'll fit. So I'm gonna do 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And then here I'm gonna do 5, 10, 15. And we're just going to do frequency here because that's what it says is a frequency histogram. And I'm going to scroll out just a little bit so I can draw my pictures. So the first one should just go up one. So the first group will just be sort of one up. The next one will go up to six. So it'll go a little bit past the five. The next one should go just before the 10. So we'll end it right there. The next one should go up to just before the 15. And then the next one should go up to a six, so just above the five. And then the last group should go to about a three, so about there, okay? And that would be my histogram. It's not the most elegant picture, but I think you get the gist. And then what is the mode of the data set? So the mode is the thing that appears the most. So this is where using the calculator would be kind of handy, because if we go look at the data set, I did not mean to do that. I did not mean to do that. Okay, if we actually go look at the data set here, what you want to do is see the thing that appeared the most. Is there any piece of data that appeared more than another? So let's go scroll back to the beginning. And no repeats. And then it looks like I have 244. So, so far, the only thing that's appeared more than once is a 44. And then the 45s, those are two. And then 246s. But then I have one, two, three, 48. So right now the 48 is the mode. 
I need something that appears more than three times. All right, there's a 51. So there's one, two, three, four. There's four 51s. So right now that would be the mode. I'm looking to see if anything appears more than four times. Note the 56 is only three. So it looks like it's the 51. Yeah, nothing else appears more than that. So the 51 would be the mode. Let's scroll back up. Yeah, so our mode would equal 51 and that's part C and this is part B, okay? And so that would be my mode of the data set. It's easier if you actually have the data set in numeric order. And just as a reminder, on your exam, I always give you data sets in numeric order. So it's a lot easier to see the mode when you can see the repeats. So just to make everyone's life easier, just so you know, I do that. Okay, let's look at number 11. And number 11 says, what do we got here? Um, for each of the following, use the mean and median to predict the shape. So for part A, it says mean equals 15.8 and the median equals 6.5. So in this case, the mean is bigger. Whenever that happens, it's going to look something like this because the mean is dragging everything up. So it's a positive or you could say a right skew. And that's always the case when the mean is bigger. For part B, it says the mean, I'm going to say X bar is 15.8 and the median is 23.2. In this case, the median is the mean is smaller. So what happens in that case is that mean drags it down. So that would be a negative or a left skew. That's always the case when the mean is the smaller number. And then for part C, the X bar is 15.8 and the median is 16. They're roughly equal. So that means it's bell-shaped. So it's gonna look something like that. So it'll be a bell shape. Okay. So that would be number 11. And that's always true. Whenever the mean is greater, it's gonna be pulling to the positive side. Whenever the mean is smaller, it's gonna to pull to the lower side. And if they're about the same, it'll be bell-shaped, okay? Let's look at number 12 here. So number 12 says the following represent the price per, in, per dose in dollars of a random sample of medications at a pharmacy. Find the mean, the median, all that stuff. So we have to find the mean. We have the mean, median, standard deviation, range, IQR, Q1, Q3, and we want the nearest sense. Okay, so let's go and put it in the calculator. Uh, I'm gonna do something first. I don't wanna have to type that L1 back in, so I'm just gonna store it in L4 just in case we need it again. Okay, clear. So edit, let's go clean out list one and let's put in the 5 5.7, 6.71, 6.84, 7.23, 8.20, 9.65, and then 24.37. And again, I'm gonna double check all of those just to be on the safe side. It's too easy to make a mistake and then pay for it later. Okay, so it looks like, so find the meaning. So all I'm gonna do is do stats, go over to calc, and I'm gonna run the one var stats, but I only want L1, so I'm gonna delete that L2 from right there. So it'll just be list will be L1, frequency list will be blank, and then I'm gonna press enter. And there goes my data. So my mean would be 11.32, and I think it's dollars. The median is gonna be farther down the list. That'll be 8.925. So 
8.93. The standard deviation will be SX, so it's 5.89. So it's really going to be 5.90 because the 9 will raise up the 8.9. The range will be the max minus the min. So that will be um, 24.37 minus the 5.78. I've got to actually calculate that. I'll do that in a second. The IQR will be Q3 minus Q1. So Q1 is 6.84. Q3 is 14.71. So what I'll do is actually go calculate those two things. So if I do 24.37 minus 5.78, I get 18.59. And then Q1 minus Q3 would literally be the 14.71 minus the 6.84. So if I take these two and put them over here, it'd be 7.87. And again, I think this is dollars. Let me do this. Yeah, it's price per dollar. So all of these would have a dollar sign in front. Okay, um, and interpret the following values in a sentence, the median IQR, and so for part B, the median is equal to 8.93. So what you'd say is 50% um, of the medications cost less than 893 because that's what the median is it's always the midpoint of all the data and then i also want to interpret the iqr so for the iqr basically the middle 50 percent of medications or the middle, yeah, have a range of 787. And then the last one is Q3, which is the 14.71. And so what we would say about that is 75% of the medications cost less than 1471. That's a one. Huh. And those would be the interpretations for those. And then C wants to use the IQR method. So we want to do the lower fence. which will be Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. So for us, it would be Q1 is 6.84 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which we already know is 787. So we'll calculate that. And then the upper fence is equal to Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So Q3 was 1471. So this will be 1471 plus 1 1.5 times 787. So let's go calculate both of those. So we're going to have 6.84 minus 1.5 times 7.87. So minus 4.97, and we'll round it to two because it's money, and then 14.71 plus 1 1.5 times 7.87, and I get 26.52. And again, I'm rounding those to two places. So then what I have to do is you look at the data set and anything that is less than negative 4.97 or above 526 would be an outlier. So any number less than 
negative 4.97 or greater than 26.52 would be an outlier. And if you look at the data set, we don't have anything in that range. So in this case, we have none. Because there's no numbers that are less than the negative 0.47 or greater than the 26. The largest number we have is 2437. So we wouldn't have anything like that. OK. And so that would be part C. Yep. And then part D, suppose the medication um, that cost 2437 was incorrectly reported as 244.37. How does this affect the median? How does it affect the mean? What is the what property? OK, so the median stays the same. The mean will increase if we add um, 244.37 instead of uh, 2437. And you actually don't have to do the calculation, but if you want to see it, what you could do is let's go back to the data set, just go to edit and go down to that last piece of data and you'll see that it doesn't change. So make this 244.37, so add that extra four. If I then go through and do the one of our stats again, you'll see up here, the mean was 11, now it's 33. But if you scroll down, the median was 8.925, so 8.93, it stayed the same. So whenever you have an extreme value, it really doesn't change the median at all, but it will change the median. And what property? Um, this tells us the median is robust or resistant. to extreme scores, which means it didn't affect it, the mean is not. So the mean, and that's the one flaw, if you remember when we talked about mean, that um, the mean is very sensitive to extreme scores. So you can kind of see it in that problem. OK, so we're getting there. You can see we still have a ways to go. I scroll through. So we have 21 problems. We're on 13. So we're past the halfway point. So number 13. So, all right, let's see what we got here. It says a student filling out college applications requires that she supply either her SAT score or her math AT, ACT score. She scored 610 on the math SAT and 27 on the ACT. So let's do SAT ACT. I have to write everything down to keep it organized. So on the SAT score, she scored 610. That would be her score. So we'll call that X. And then the ACT, she got a 27. So that's our data point. What should she report she should give? So she wants to do the one she did better. So the mean, so the X bar for the SAT is 515. And the standard deviation is 114. But on the ACT, the mean score was 21 and the standard deviation was 5.1. So what I would do is go find Z for both of them. So Z in this case will be 610 minus 515 all over 114. And then over here, Z will be uh, 27 minus 21 all over 5.1. So then we just have to actually calculate those. So let's go do that. Don't forget to use parentheses. So parentheses 610 minus 515 and my parenthesis divide that by 114 and I get 0.833 repeating so I would just say 0.83 you usually round z scores to two places and then 27 minus 21 and then divide that by 5.1 so it's always the score minus the mean and for here I get 1.7, I'm sorry, 1 point, 1 1.176. So I would round that to 1.18. 
Okay, so first off, those are our z scores. And again, don't forget to use your parentheses in that numerator. So I'll put those in in red. Um, if you don't, you'll get the wrong z score. Okay, so then it says, um, which should she report? So technically, this is the better score. So what I would su suggest is she should submit the ACT score as she was much higher um, than the mean on the ACT than she was on SAT, basically the Z score of ACT was larger. So she did better, it's relatively higher. So she did above the mean on both of them because they're both positive, but she did more above the mean on the ACT than she did on the SAT because um, it's a more positive number. So she actually just did better um, in that score, okay? Let's look at number 14. Okay. Um, I'll leave that there for a second. So in 14, it says, suppose that a certain brand of light bulb has a mean life of 450 hours and a standard deviation of 73 hours. Would it be unusual for a light bulb to have a lifespan of 320 hours, 615 hours justified? A histogram indicates the sample data follow a normal distribution according to the empirical rule 99.7, we fall between what? Um, so yeah, let's just go right to that. So what I would do, let's just draw a nice big old, it doesn't say in the A part about the empirical rule, but you can still kind of use that. So we know the center point is the 450. And then when you go out one standard deviation and then two, and then we could have a third one. I'm gonna run out of room there. So what I would do is let's pull up my handy dandy calculator. And I'm gonna do 450 plus one times, and I believe my standard deviation is 73. Yeah, so we'll do 73. And that means this is 523. And then I'm gonna do it again. And I put the one in there so that I could just go back over here and make the one a two. And this will be 596. And let's do one more. So 669. And then I'm going to work backwards and go make it a negative. And that means this is 231. And then I'm going to go make it a 2. The order of how you do this doesn't really matter as long as you get all the numbers in. 304. And then we have one more. Make it a 1 and I get a 377. So this is three, two, one standard deviations below and then one, two, three above. So the first thing they wanted to say, would a lifespan of 300, where if we do the for part A, would 320 hours be unusual? Well, 320 would be somewhere over here. And then the other number they had was eight, 615. And that would be, over here. So what I would say is 320 is within two standard deviations of the mean. So that would be typical, okay? Because it's within that plus or minus two. Because remember this is um, mu minus two sigma and this one's mu plus two sigma over here. And then I would say 615 is more than two standard deviations above the mean. So that means it's slightly unusual. And depending on the situation, I mean, it's, it's not quite three above, but it's in between that two and three above. So it's, it's at least slightly unusual. So you could even say slightly if you wanted in parentheses. 
Okay. And now it says a histogram indicates the data is a normal distribution. So now I can actually throw the percentages in. So when I did the A part here, I didn't really say percentages. I just said within two standard deviations or more than. So it's being very vague, but now I can put the percentages in. So it says for part B, um, the histogram indicates the sample data follow a normal distribution according to the empirical rule 99.7 of the light bulbs have a lifetime between what two values? Well, the 99.7 would be from this cutoff all the way over to that one. So I would say for here, 99.7% of the light bulbs last between 231 hours, I think it's hours, isn't it? Yeah, to 669 hours. So pretty much all the light bulbs should really last between those two cutoffs. Assuming the data are bell-shaped, I would determine the percentage of light bulbs that have a lifespan between 304 and 569. So here's your 304. Here's the 596. So that would be, if you think about it, that's the middle two. So that would be 95%. So for part C, we would say 95% of the light bulbs last between um, 304 to 596 hours. And honestly, I just drew the picture up here. I'm going to make this a little smaller so you can kind of see all the answers at once here for a second. I made um, my picture, I just drew it. But remember that handout I made in class, the practice sheet, where I said print it out and just keep writing on pencil? Um, I would have a copy of that. And that has all of the percentages written in. Um, and that's under chapter three. I think it's empirical rule practice sheet is what it's called. But remember, it's the picture, but it has all the percents written in. So I would just print that out and have that a copy of that handy. Um, in a perfect world, I'd actually say, go get um, it laminated and then write on it with one of those pens you can erase with. Um, but if you just use pencil, that would be fine. Or just make a couple copies of it. So if you ruin one, you have another handy. Um, rather than drawing the picture every time, you could just use that picture. And that's nice because it has all the percents. Okay. So that would be 14. I think I got all parts of 14. And let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. Let's go to 15. And after you've watched this video, if you still have questions, you can still come and ask me questions, no problem. The following data are the number of text messages sent per day for a sample of high school students. Approximate the mean of the text messages, approximate the standard deviation. So what I'm gonna need for that, um, I'm gonna do the number of text. I'm gonna need my midpoints. And then I'm gonna need my frequency. So, I'm going 40 to 49 here. The next one is 50 to 59. The next one is 60 to 69, 70 to 79, um, 80 to 89, 90 to 99, and then 100 to 109. So what I'm gonna need is the midpoints. Now I'm gonna do this so it's all even. So my frequencies are 8, 44, 23, 6, 107, 11, and 1. So this will be my L2. I need L1, though. So remember the midpoints. I could see the class width is 10. So the first midpoint would be 40 plus 50 divided by 2. So it's going to be a 45. So that would go here. But if these are all off by 10, I can just keep adding the class width. So that means this will be 55, 65, 75, 85, 95, 105. So if the width is 10, once you figure that out, and it's always the difference between two lower limits. Um, once I figure out the first midpoint, you could just keep adding the width. So what that now means, if I want to find the mean and all that, let's go clear this out. Go to stat. You're going to have to go edit the data. So I'm going to go enter this. And my L1, so L1 will be the 45, the 55, 65, 75, that should be 85. I don't know what I was thinking there, but this will be 85. I don't know where 89 came from. 85, uh, 95, and 105. 
So again, double check that I put all those in there correctly. It should all be off by 10. Okay, and then I have to go over to L2 and now I have to put in the frequencies and it's really important you don't forget the frequencies. I remember to clear out the list, put the cursor on the list, hit clear and then the down arrow key. And now I put in my frequencies and that's just telling me I have eight people in the first group, 44 in the second group, um, 23 in the next group, six in the next group, 107 in the flat, that group and then 11 and then one and again always double check the data i know it's a little extra time to do that but if you screw up entering it here then it just makes everything off later so then i'm going to go i'm just going to quit this i'm going to go to stat i'm going to go over to calc and now i have to make sure that i have l1 and i put in the l2 so make sure you put in that l2 and you'll notice all i did was put the cursor where the l2 should be B and I did second two because right above the L the two it says L2. And then I'm going to press enter. And I can see that my X bar is equal to 74.85. And I'm not sure what the question asked for. So let's go back. It says approximate your mean number of text messages per day round to one decimal place. So for part A, my mean will be roughly 74.9 texts. Um, approximate the standard deviation. So for part B, we're going to want your SX. And again, I think it says round to two decimal places. And for me, I would just say text messages per day. Um, so the standard deviation is 14.72 because it's 715. So 72 texts or whatever units you want. You could say text per day. So you could, or you could say text per day. TPD if you wanted. Um, what is the width of the data set? So for part C, the width, if you look at it, it's going to be the 50 minus the 40, which is 10. Or you can do any two consecutive ones. I always just do the first two. So subtract those two. So it's 10 texts per day, TPD. Um, what is the width of the data? We've got that. And so what is the, and, OK, so part D would be, is it unusual for a student to send 100 or more texts per day? Justify your answer. I would say yes, because there was only one person in that group. So more than 100 seems unusual. Um, we could check. And usually if you do mu plus or minus two sigma, you can get it from there. So if we do 74.85 plus or minus two times 14.72, if 100 falls in there, we wouldn't consider it unusual. But you could argue a little bit, it's a little bit on the unusual side because it is on the higher end and there's only one person in that group. But a good way to do it is to just do the, um, kind of use the empirical rule here and just do the two standard deviations because that's kind of a good standard cutoff. And I think if we do that, you're gonna see that it doesn't quite fall unusual. So it'd be seven, two, that's a two. Um, you can see my lower end is 45. And then if I go back and just change it to a positive and do a plus, we get, so basically we get a range of uh, 45.41 to 104.29. So essentially 100 is not too unusual, but you could say it is near the high end. So one of the things I kind of wanted to illustrate, if you just look at the data set and say, oh, there's only one in that group, um, it seems unusual. What we could do to check it, though, is look at the range rule. And then when we do that, we see that it falls within the range. So it's not unusual, but it is towards the high end. OK, so we can kind of you can always add a little bit of a clarifier to something, even if it falls in the normal range to say, well, yeah, it's smack dab in the middle of the normal range or no, it's in the normal range, but it's not the higher end. Um, so as long as it shows that you're thinking about your answer, there, there can be more than one correct answer or more than one correct interpretation. Um, I think it's kind of like sometimes when you're looking at a, a painting and they say interpret what the artist was thinking. I think there's a few ways you can go with that. Um, anyway, um, let's look at number 16. Okay, the sample of college students were asked to classify their political views. The results are summarized in the graph below. How many students participated in the study? I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because I can't see that. 
that well. I'm not that good. And it looks like the lines all fall nicely. So for part A, it looks like our total would be 8 plus 10 plus 12. So it looks like we'd have 30 total. OK. Um, ah, let me do that. OK, by literally because it looks like each one of those actually intersects a box. So that's nice. And what percentage of the students responded moderate? So moderate is the last group. And so it would basically for B, it would be the 12 out of the 30, but it wants it as a percentage. So I'm going to actually have to go calculate that. And I get 0.4. So that would be 40 percent. Consider themselves moderate. OK, so that would be that one. So this one's kind of nice because if you blow the picture up, you can read the numbers. So you want to be able to do that. OK. And all right, we just got a couple more here. I'm sure everyone. And again, you don't have to watch the video in one full swoop, but I'm going to try to film it in one fell swoop. Um, determine whether the standard, the underlying value is a statistic or parameter. OK, in a survey of 100 Santa Monica College students, 25% of the respondents reported that they have um, involved at least one car accident. So for part A, it's going to be a statistic because it's a sample. OK, so anytime something's related to, and it's just 100 Santa Monica students, um, we're used more than that. Where if you look at part B, it says 52.5% of all. So um, that's doing all, so that's a parameter because it's based on all. And that would be your population. So whenever it's based on a population, it's a parameter. When it's based on the sample, it's a statistic. Okay, and that would be number 17. That was a nice short one. Um, 18, give an example of each of the following. So here there could be a lot of answers. Um, Response bias um, that could be um, where you know you answer something a political question more neutral. than you really think. So rather than you know maybe answering something with um, a really strong viewpoint, you go more neutral. So basically, you kind of fudge your answer a little bit. A non-response is literally that. We um, chose to not answer because you don't really have to have reason, but we could say because the question is too personal. You just didn't want to answer. Okay, that would be more non-response. So you literally don't answer. And then sampling bias, um, that really could be a case of convenient sampling where you only ask your friend's opinions. Like you're trying to figure out the opinion on something general, but you only ask people you know. That would be a sampling bias because it's very convenient. Okay. And you could have, there could be obviously many more examples of those. All right. I'm going to run out of paper soon, too. Hopefully, I can squeeze these in. Number 19 um, the stem and leaf diagram represents the ages of presidents at their time of inauguration. What is the modal age of inauguration? So for here, you have to kind of go look and figure out. So the ages are 42, 43, 46, 46, 47, 47, and 48. So I want to find where I have the most repeats. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because it's hard for me to read that. And it looks like one, two, three, four, five there. One, two, three, four there. One, two, three, four there. It looks like the four is here. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five. There's 554. So for number 19, it looks like the mode is 54 years. 
for part A. That looks like that's one of, and you have to, it, I can't draw on this one here, but if you underline, it looks like the fours here appear the most. And if I go back, that would be 54. It doesn't look like I have anything else that appears that often, okay? For part B, what is the shape of the distribution? So what I would almost do is kind of look at this on its side. And if you draw sort of a, a graph, it looks like it's mostly bell-shaped with maybe a slight positive skew. So I would say bell-shaped. And if you wanted to, you could say a slight positive skew, but honestly, I'd probably just go with bell-shaped because if you draw like a curve over it, if you kind of look at it and you draw like a curve over this, you can see it's got a little bit of a tail, but I would say to me, it looks mostly bell-shaped. I'm trying to look at it sideways. And how many of the presidents were 60 years of age or older at the time of inauguration? So for part C, we have 60 or older. So it looks like, does it tell me how many presidents we have at this time? Um, I'm not sure when this was taken. Um, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. So we do have 45. So your N is 45. And then what we would say is greater than or equal to 60. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it would be 11 out of the 45. Um, actually, just says how many. So we could just say 11, 11 were 60 or older. What would have been nicer on this question, and I probably would have done it for you, is told you how many presidents there was. Now, I just wasn't sure how if this was up to date. Um, or if it was a little bit lagging behind where we are president wise. Okay. Um, so it would have been nice to know which one we were on. So it looks like a 11 um, or older. So unless I counted wrong, I think we're good on that one. And then number 20, we're getting there. I think we just have two more. Um, in a random sample of used cars sold in Los Angeles, the mean selling price was 10,178 with a standard deviation of 3074. So we'll say the X bar was 10178 and the S was 3074. It doesn't say how many cars though. Um, if you do not know the shape of the distribution, what can be said about the percentage of cars in Los Angeles that sell between um, 4,000 and change up to 16? So what I would probably do for part A is just look at X bar plus or minus one S and then do two and three, you know, so X bar plus or minus two S and so on, just to kind of get a range. We don't know that it's bell shaped, so we'd have to use the Chebyshev rule, but let's look at what 10,178 plus or minus um, one times 3074 is, and then we'll do it again, and hopefully we'll hit those two numbers um, that they're looking at. So we're gonna have 10178, minus one times 3074. And I get to, if I do that, it's 7104. And we'll do the plus side. I didn't mean to do that. We'll go change it to a plus. And honestly, one wasn't gonna work anyway because you can't use one with Chebyshev's rule but we'll do it anyway. And then we'll do it again. We'll do 10178 plus or minus two times 3074. And I have a feeling that's gonna match up with our numbers. So let's do second enter, go change that to a minus two. And so my lower end will be 4030. And then if I do second enter, and do plus, I get 16326. So that would mean, you know, it's basically X bar plus or minus two times S. So we have a two there. And if we go to our table for Chebyshev's rule, this would be at least 75% fall between the 4030 and 
the 16326. So if it were bell shaped, we could up that to 95%. But since it's not, we have to go with the 75. And that would be the two numbers here. So that does match. So basically, I'm using that other that handout that we had. Um, so just to remind you, I'm going to this handout. So mm -mm -mm. it's the practice one. So if you look, I'm actually using these numbers and then here's your Chebby Chef's rule. So when you use the X bar plus or minus two S it's the at least 75%. So that's the rule I'm using for that. So that, that was the handout I was talking about earlier. Okay. And then it says, so that would be part A. Oh, and I'm running out of room here. So, and then it says, if it is known that the selling price of used cars is bell shaped, 68% of the data would fall between what two. So that would actually be this one. So 68% falls here. So this would actually be part A is right here. This is now part B. And the only reason I'm doing that is I just, I'm at the end of my paper here, so I can't write. Um, and there you go for that one. And then the final one, and I didn't mean to do that. I'm gonna have to squeeze this in. Um, let me do it kind of. Um, I didn't give myself quite enough room, but I'll, I'll try and make this work. According to the national statistics, 10 year old girl that is 53.2 inches tall is in the 30th percentile. What does that mean? And it means essentially 30%, and this is 21, 30% of 10 year old girls are less than 53.2 inches tall. I know I'm kind of really squeezing that into the bottom there, but that's essentially what it means. Okay. Percentile means that's always the percentage that are less than that value. You could also say that it means 70% are larger, but I would go with less than. Okay. And I know that that kind of got squeezed at the bottom there, um, but that would be number 21. Okay. So um, hopefully that wasn't too quick. All your answers are here. Um, Hopefully you can pause the recording and stop when you need. Um, I'll save this handout that I wrote on right here and I'll put it with um, your chapter three handout so that you'll know those are the answers um, written out and that will accompany this recording. And I'm gonna go stop it and take a break and then I'll make the recording for chapter five, but there you go. <laughs>